Good morning all and welcome to the final online seminar for Myeloma Awareness Month. My name is Linda Saunders. I am the wellbeing lead or coordinator of the national online education programs and support groups at the Leukemia Foundation Australia. We'd like to commence proceedings today with an acknowledgement to country. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognise that there are many Victorians online today who are currently in lockdown. This can bring up many challenges in addition to living with myeloma. Please know both the Leukemia Foundation and Myeloma Australia stand with you and are available to support you through these really challenging times. Thanks, Linda. My name's Nella Coombe and I'm the Manager of Nursing and Patient Services at Myeloma Australia. Today, Myeloma Australia and Leukemia Foundation Australia have come together to deliver this session to you. As two prominent cancer community organisations that support people living with myeloma, we believe there is great strength and value in partnership. Today's theme is around hope and awareness. Hope for the future of new and innovative treatments that will continue to improve the long-term survival and quality of life for people living with myeloma. What a great note to end Myeloma Month on. We have a great lineup of speakers for you this morning. We'll start the day with Bernadette sharing her story of living life with myeloma and what was made possible for her as a result of new treatments available. We will then have Professor Hung Quach, a haematologist from Melbourne, talking about new and innovative treatments. And we will take a, a short break then and return with Dr. Kate Van Dyke, a researcher from Adelaide, who will share with us the exciting work being done in the world of myeloma research in her laboratory followed by Dr. Nick Weber, a haematologist from Brisbane, who will be speaking about making treatment decisions and drug approval process, particularly relevant in light of the several changes and approvals of late. Thanks, Nella. We'd like to remind you to send your questions in the question box that um, is immediately below this live stream. We will do our best to try and get to all your questions, but if we don't, we'll endeavour to get back to you um, after the event. Also, one final reminder, we greatly appreciate feedback and would love to hear from you all about what we've done well, what we could improve on, and perhaps some topic suggestions for future events um, and perhaps Myeloma uh, Month next year in 2022. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker um, and while well, the audience sit, sits back and relaxes, um, Bernard, we have Bernadette Savinoff with us um, and Bernadette is going to share with us her personal experience of living with myeloma and how she maintained hope despite the ups and downs and what was made possible in life for her because of the access to new and innovative myeloma treatments. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And good morning to all the guest speakers as well. I'll probably get your names wrong. So I'll just say good morning in general. It is such a privilege to share with you all today some of my myeloma journey. And um, as you will know, it's a very twisty trip uh, and it's definitely unpacked more surprises and changes of direction than any journey that I would have chosen for myself. Um, however, today I really want to talk about the framework that's helped me to navigate my way forward in hope. A really, really good friend of mine gave me some advice at the beginning of my journey, which was make sure that you've got someone or something that can be your gatekeeper. And so for me, this word gatekeeper has meant really choosing very carefully who or what I allow access to all of the influx into my life, particularly in this area. The emotions, the information, family and friends situations, all the life circumstances, all the things that flood my way to really be mindful and choose carefully through my gatekeepers what I allow to come into my life. Um, the big who of this gatekeeper has been my husband. 
He fills this role incredibly well. Uh, and I, I just could not have done this without him. He's literally been my gatekeeper in terms of a physical person who's kept the borders of my life safe and, and really tended to me. He's carried me physically at times if needed, and uh, he's really kept things going in our family. And what this has allowed for me is just space to rest, to, to think through things, to have the freedom to be just still and to be safe and to be in whatever state I needed to be in. There's been all manner of states that I've been in. Um, I guess the what as my gatekeeper has been my love for my husband and my, my children. We have four children. Uh, there they are. <laughs> And they, they range from preteens through to young adults. So we have a busy, happy, loud, noisy, fun family. Um, my faith is, has helped and also just understanding my own personality, who I am, what I like, what I don't like, um, what helps me, what doesn't help me. So those are the things that have kept me focused and made sure that where I choose to put my time, my energy towards healing, my resources, where I, how I make my decisions, keep them matched up to those central themes of my life, the things that I know are important to me. It also allows for a baseline to know when to adjust, to when to accept something new um, or when to toss something out. That's definitely true in regards to medications and access to things. So as new things come up, you, you need to align them. And is this something that's good? Is it gonna work? Is it gonna work for me according to what I know about myself? And if it's not, then maybe I need to adjust and accept it in, in a different way than I would have in the past. Um, so that gatekeeping has been really true for me in personal ways in my life, but also in those medical spaces that I now inhabit. Um, I know and I understand and respect that every person's journey on the myeloma path is, is a shocking and a, and a, and a different one. Um, but I really believe, I think that everyone has to find out what it is that motivates them and, and just clarifies how they choose to walk through this, particularly with just that stream of information that is always coming. Um, I was a high energy, very organized person, really active in sports, um, especially two things, my favorite things, basketball and running. Uh, and I enjoyed helping out in various roles across lots of community platforms that I'm involved in. Just multitasking physically, mentally, emotionally was normal for me. Um, so late November 19, uh, sorry, 19, 2016, um, I went to see my GP because I thought just maybe that extreme tiredness and breathlessness that I was experiencing maybe wasn't just due to running a busy family and, and studying part time and homeschooling our youngest daughter and all of those things. Um, I was 42 years old and had absolutely no inkling of what was to come. I am just going to say here, I'm eternally grateful to my doctors, both my GP and my specialist for their care and expertise. My GP just really pursued those symptoms of severe anemia, which is what how I presented. Um, he was very thorough and referred me directly to my hematologist. Uh, that ultimately led to a, an early diagnosis of multiple myeloma, but there was very little bone involvement and no organ damage. So thankful and so grateful for that. Um, my hematologist, I'm thankful that he's very calmly fielded all of my concerns and questions. Uh, he's talked me through each treatment and all of, that entails. Um, and he's also kept me well informed of updates to things on the, like medications on PBS and other, other treatments that uh, he's been able to explain to me or offer or um, give me advice on. Um, that moment of knowledge for every one of us, what is myeloma, how, what, why, um, that's had a huge effect obviously in, in our lives, my family, my children, our wider community. Um, but for this purpose of this time, I'll just quickly outline um, the medical steps and the treatments that I've been through and how they've helped me to a place of, of greater wellness. Um, it was a two year process for me, going from that diagnosis in 2016 to uh, on a watch and wait, uh, and then diving into active treatment in 2019. Uh, obviously the symptoms increased, uh, everything, all that multitasking went right away. Uh, and uh, I began the 16 weeks of VCD induction for preparation for stem cell transplant. That was at the beginning of 2019. Um, I had the stem cell transplant in June of 2019. Um, this produced a partial response. So while it was good and the uh, my numbers had been coming down um, through the VCD treatment and then the stem cell. It wasn't what we were hoping in that zero uh, moment, um, but definitely has, has brought that down and, and 
was the hardest thing in my life. I hope I don't have to do one again. Um, but thankful that I could do that as well. Um, I was also involved in um, a myeloma exercise study four months post SCT, uh, and that was run by university here. And I'll speak to that a little bit more in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I did have to go and am currently on maintenance treatment. I first started on thalidomide, which I really didn't want to go on. So again, had to really go through those gatekeeper processes. What is this? How's this work for me? Will it be according to how and how and what I need? Um, at the time, I, I wanted to go on to Revlimid. Uh, that was not on the PBS at that point in time. So I did stay on the dex dexamethasone and thalidomide for about four months after my SCT. Um, then thankfully the um, Revlimid was listed on the PBS so I could change over to that. Um, I did have, however, already have some peripheral neuropathy from the thalidomide and definitely the fatigue issues for me. Um, I don't seem to experience that on the Revlimid, which is wonderful. <clears throat> um, so I remain on that as my maintenance treatment, uh, 10 milligrams of Revlimid daily uh, plus aspirin. And this actually has continued to bring those PP levels down, which is just wonderful every time you hold your breath when you have those blood tests and, uh, and wait. Um, and we're really thankful that that has been um, continuing on a, on a good downward trajectory. Um, I do now take uh, something to combat some of the Revlimid side effects that I do get. Um, and I think all of you on this journey will understand. I feel a little bit sometimes like the, the lady who swallowed a fly. I take this to take that, to get rid of that, to get rid of that. And now I take this because it's good, but it's still doing something else to my body that wasn't particularly nice. So um, yeah, these myeloma treatments have changed me. Um, they've caused, yes, loss of energy, loss of physical ability, loss of hair. I've just had my first haircut. I'm very thankful for my hair coming back. Um, and definitely a lessened capacity to cope with all the incoming and outgoing stimuli uh, in my life. Um, but that's just to name a few, but uh, it's, and it's never nice to be brought to tears as I have often about your lack in any space. And I think all of you will probably be able to nod your heads and understand that. Um, through living with blood cancer, one of my persistent goals for me and for our family has to try and focus my energy on keeping things as normal as possible at home. And that requires pretty much all of my energy. Um, words like balance, capacity, now, later, and enough <laughs> have definitely deepened in my meaning and application. And that um, is a learning journey that I'm still on. Uh, however, in every step of my treatment journey, I've been able to ask through those gatekeeper processes, how does this support me? How does this keep me moving forward? And how does this keep me looking towards um, the future with hope? Um, and despite the costs of traveling through this, um, will this benefit? Will it flow into my important people and the spheres and the places that I inhabit? Will it bring more into that? Will it, will it bring me more into those spheres that, as I want to be? Um, and I'm really, really, really blessed to have journeyed through to this place of wellness um, very much facilitated by the medicine and the medical personnel that I've had access to right here in my city. Uh, very high quality and I, I can't be thankful enough for the fact that um, I've been able to access that. So that's been incredibly huge in my journey. Um, for me personally, one of the most incredible things uh, post SCT was my inclusion um, in a myeloma exercise study, as I said, was run by the univers a university here. This I was referred to this by my haematologist um, and it just was the perfect timing after my SCT for me to begin to build up some strength and stamina. I, I actually wish that everybody could be offered something like this. It was two, exercise, uh, two, two sessions weekly with an exercise physiologist for six months and then continuing that program with a, with a check-in. And it, it, it just was amazing. It not only um, helped me in a physical sense, in my, in my capacity of strength and, and those things, but it really helped to shape my perceptions about my new self after all these treatments. Um, yes, strengthened in my physical body, but this really, it in turn, really positively affected my mental space and my emotional state. And it really uh, allowed me to see that I had far less limitations than what I had thought. Helped me to push a little bit harder, helped me to just yeah, grab a hold of things that I may have been a little bit more tentative to. So I'm very, very thankful for being able to be part of that. 
after the series of all these treatments and ongoing medications, I am able now to run again, not fast and nowhere near as often, but I'm back to doing something that I love in that space. Um, I'm also currently able to play basketball, definitely play differently. Um, it's changed some things, um, but again, thinking through those gatekeepers, I can do something I love. I, I'm careful about the way that I do it. Um, it really helps to bring uh, that light and joy back into my life. I'm much more able to invest uh, time, energy, my love into, into my family and to my community. And I think bottom line is I'm, I'm here. I'm here because of these treatments and I've gained back in areas that give me purpose and meaning and joy. Um, it's not over. This road is a long one, as we all know. It's up and it's down and uh, it's definitely very hard at times. But I feel that through choosing my gatekeepers wisely and, and really working through those, um, it's kept me journeying well. And I hope as there more, um, more information and more treatments come to the fore in these new times that it will keep me journeying in a good way. Thank you so much. Bernadette, thank you so much for um, sharing your experience. And I really loved your use of language and some of the words you used to describe your experience. Um, in particular, I thought how you reframed your goals. So how you adjusted to life with myeloma. And by doing so, by reframing your life goals, you're still able to continue to I guess, pursue the areas of life that really mattered to you. And I'm really, I love how you highlighted that. So thank you once again for setting the scene for today, mm -hmm. for setting that scene of awareness and hope um, that we hope to be able to impart to the, to the myeloma community. I'd now like to hand over to Kath, who's coming to you from New South Wales to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Kath. Good morning. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Bowley, one of the myeloma support nurses in New South Wales with Myeloma Australia. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today. Professor Hung Quach of the University of Melbourne is the Director of Clinical Hematology and Clinical Hematology Research at St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. She is a member of the International Myeloma Working Group and a member of the Myeloma Scientific Advisory Group for Myeloma Australia. In addition, Professor Quatch is the co-chair of the Myeloma Working Group of the Australasian Lymphoma Leukemia Group. Her clinical and translational research focuses on novel therapeutics and their impact on immunology and the microenvironment in multiple myeloma. Professor Quatch is joining us today to talk about new treatments in myeloma. Thank you, Professor Quatch. Uh, thank you very much, Kath, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, my name's Hung Quach and uh, the topic for today is new treatments in multiple myeloma. Um, look, I just want to say a thank you uh, to Myeloma Australia and Leukemia Foundation Australia for holding this seminar. Uh, the topic today is new treatments in multiple myeloma in recognition of uh, Myeloma Australia Month. Uh, and even though the topic is new treatments, I will take any questions pertaining to multiple myeloma. So I do encourage that uh, everyone um, uh, submit their questions so I may be able to answer them at the end. Now, a lot of change uh, since the last time I gave one of these talks. Um, and I, you know, I used to say that, or I still do say that multiple myeloma remains an incurable disease and that's still true. But increasingly, the word uh, cure or more specifically operational cure is being thrown into the mix. And just to explain briefly, when we say a disease is cured, we mean that the disease is permanently eradicated, never to relapse. To do this in multiple myeloma, uh, we would have to uh, eradicate every single stem, stem cells of the myeloma, leaving none to relapse in the future. Currently, we're not able to do that yet. Uh, and all we've been able to do is induce a deeper and deeper response, as you can see there, with lower and lower myeloma burden into, in the body, so that when we stop treatment, it takes longer and longer for the disease to relapse. Now, more recently, we've been able to induce uh, a depth of response um, to the extent of something called minimum residual disease negativity, that's MRD negativity. And what this means 
is that the burden of myeloma is so low that's less than one myeloma cells in 100,000 normal cells in the bone marrow. And you can see from the dotted line on the right-hand side there that when we stop treatment, it takes quite a long time for the, the disease to come back. Now, nowadays, we're not only trying to achieve a deep response, we're also trying to maintain that response utilizing uh, immunotherapies and other maintenance therapies so that even though you live with low level disease burden, uh, the disease doesn't relapse in this lifetime. And so that is a concept of operational cures. Now, before I talk about the new therapies in myeloma, I want to briefly give an overview of the current understanding of how myeloma cells come about, just to give you a bit of a framework of where our new drug sits. And so we know for a fact that most myeloma starts off within the bone marrow. That's the factory where we make blood. And when a normal plasma cells, that's an immune cells become myeloma, the first thing it does is that it grows develop sticky molecules or sticky proteins on its surface to allow it to stick very strongly to the surrounding uh, bone marrow cells, so the soil. And when it does that, it then secretes a whole bunch of growth factors and nutrients for the soil to grow. So it's almost like these myeloma cells are trying to establish a fertile soil around itself to promote its growth, including blood vessels that can then bring nutrients and um, oxygen to the myeloma cells. Once the soil grow, the soil can then in turn produce a lot of growth factors and nutrients for the myeloma cells itself. And so you can see there's now a symbiosis type of relationship, a vicious cycle, whereby the myeloma cells produce an abnormal surrounding soil and the surrounding soil will then uh, promote the myeloma cell growth. Now, in normal circumstances, when myeloma cells develop, our immune system is supposed to recognize the myeloma cells and kill it. And so the, um, uh, the, uh, one of the immune cells called the antigen presenting cells, these are like police cells. They're, they're supposed to go around, find the myeloma cells, eat them up, and then present bits and pieces of it to the headquarter immune cells called T cells. These T cells are headquarter immune cells, and they're supposed to recruit a whole host of an army of immune cells, natural killer cells, macrophages, etc., that will come and kill the myeloma. And so this is the concept of anti-myeloma immunity. The problem is that when myeloma becomes aggressive, they can express on their surface various proteins that trick our immune system, that uh, blocks the function of not only T cells, but natural killer cells. And so you can see when it comes to myeloma, there are three areas of um, abnormality or pathology. The first area is the myeloma cells itself being cancerous. The second area is the abnormal fertile soil within our bone marrow that promote the myeloma cell growth. And the third area of abnormality is the impaired immune function. And so in the past, all we had to treat multiple myeloma uh, was chemotherapy. And that weren't very effective because all chemotherapy does is that it it causes myeloma cells to die, but it doesn't address the microenvironment and it doesn't address the immune system. So we're not very effective. And then at the turn of the century, uh, we then had immunomodulatory drugs and proteasome inhibitors. Many of uh, you, if you're a, you're a patient and you're getting treatment, would be getting these types of drugs. And these types of drugs are more effective because not only do they force myeloma cells to commit suicide, they also impact on the microenvironment, making the surrounding soil less fertile. But going forward, we are now entering a new era. And that new era is the era of immune therapy. For the first time, we can now address the third part of pathology of this whole process, uh, that is the immune paresis. And there are various immune therapies such as monoclonal antibodies, CAR T cells, uh, T cell engagers, natural killer cell engagers, and antibody drug conjugates. So you can see there's a whole host of immune therapy. We're going to go into detail in a bit. But there is also another group of drugs uh, called small molecules. And these small molecules are tiny, tiny drugs that can get into the cells very easily. And the three drugs I also want to talk about are venetoclax, selenexor, and iberdamide. Let's first talk about immune therapies. 
Now, the concept that the immune system can protect us against tumor uh, development uh, has been discovered more than 100 years ago. And it was discovered by this great immunologist called Pearl Ehrlich. And he described the fact that in our body, every time a cancer cell develops, so you can see on the left there, the tumor cells, every time a cell becomes cancerous, it's supposed to be recognized by the immune cells, the police cells that I spoke about, the antigen presenting cells. And these antigen presenting cells eat up the bits and pieces of these abnormal cancer cells presented to the T cells, which are the headquarters immune cells. The headquarter immune cells will then um, be able to recognize the myeloma cells and induce an immune response against that. And that's why a lot of us, we may develop nidus of cancer, but never progresses. The problem with most cancer when they're rampant, particularly multiple myeloma, is that this whole system is now corrupt, such that when the antigen presenting cells present bits of the myeloma or the cancer to the T cells, rather than saying, hey, this is an enemy, come and kill it, it's saying, hey, this is a friend, don't kill it. So the T cells, rather than becoming all angry and killing the myeloma cells, is now all happy and inhibitory, and this is called a regulatory T cells. So how do we overcome this? There are several mechanisms to overcome this. And the first group of drugs uh, I'm going to talk about uh, is called monoclonal antibodies. Now, antibodies, as you know, are, are produced by our immune B cells to fight infection when we have infection. They, those are natural antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are man-made antibodies that are engineered uh, to attack myeloma cells or cancer cells. Now, in the, set, in, in the setting of multiple myeloma, uh, uh, that the protein that the antibody is engineered to recognize is called CD38. And examples of antibodies that can recognize CD38 uh, are daratumumab and isotuximab. Some of you may be familiar with these antibodies already. And so CD38 is highly expressed on myeloma cells. So daratumumab or isotuximab, when bound to the CD38 on myeloma cells, can then initiate a whole bunch of immune response. The first type of immune response is that with the other hand, uh, the anti-CD38 antibody can attract an immune cell called macrophages that can come and eat up the myeloma cells, as you can see in the pink there. Or they can also attract another type of immune cells called natural killer cells. And these cells can come and secrete various enzymes to dissolve the myeloma cells. And the third way they can kill the myeloma cells are that these antibodies can induce a pathway called the complement pathway activation. And they punch holes within the membrane of the myeloma cells, causing the myeloma cells to dissolve. But in addition to that, these drugs also have uh, aspects that are independent of their immune function in that by binding the CD38 uh, on the surface of the myeloma cells, they cause the myeloma cells to commit suicide, a, a process called apoptosis. And the third mechanism is that these, immune, um, these antibodies can stimulate the immune system in general by in, inhibiting the friendly T cells that I spoke to you about, the T regulatory uh, cells. So as, as a single agent, these, these drugs are quite effective. So daratumumab, uh, as you know, have already been approved by our pharmaceutical benefit scheme for the treatment of patients with multiple myeloma who are in first relapse, but only in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone. Uh, it's, it's given intravenously, so it's through the veins. Uh, there's a, form, a new formulation. You can give it under the skin, uh, usually given uh, once a week for the first two weeks and then once every two weeks for another four times, and then maintenance once every month for as long as you respond. Uh, Esatuximab uh, is virtually identical uh, uh, with minor difference. Um, it's also given through the veins, uh, and the subcutaneous formulation is currently uh, under clinical trial, um, given weekly for the first four weeks, and then every two weeks onward. Uh, I have to say that out of all the drugs that I've experienced, these uh, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies are one of the most well-tolerated drugs I've ever seen. Uh, the main side effect is usually, or 
sometimes infusional reaction with the first infusion. So that's because your immune system can get a bit excited uh, 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 at the first infusion. So the person can get a bit of a reaction such as um, fever or, or a high heart rate, but usually it's very well tolerated. Um, the patient on the right hand side there is a patient of mine. Uh, she's been on daratumumab for at least four years and then she came off it because of a, a, a reason unrelated to cancer, um, uh, to myeloma, sorry. Uh, and it's been six years and she still remains in complete remission. So uh, I am a fan of these agents. Uh, we currently in um, uh, St. Vincent's do have a clinical study uh, utilizing isotuximab on top of various backbones um, of my for myeloma. Uh, now this uh, slide here is just to show you that uh, daratumumab, but also isotuximab uh, has been combined with various backbones that we have for myeloma only because they're so well tolerated. And in all of the clinical trials, just to summarize, uh, the addition of daratumumab or isotuximab to the various backbones have always shown to be better compared to the backbone on its own with respect to progression-free survival. And so um, there are a number of other very promising antibodies uh, uh, in the on the horizon, as you can see there. The ones in yellow or orange um, are the ones that are either in clinical uh, arena already or very close to. Uh, MOR, MORO202 is another example of a CD38 monoclonal antibody. And then there's another antibody called Elotuzumab, which some of you might have been treated with before. This is a separate antibody due, uh, to another protein called SLAMF7 rather than CD38. Um, on its own, it's not very effective, but when you combine it with other immune therapy, it's synergistic, so uh, very impressive. So I'm hoping that it will be revived again for use in Australia. Now, the next group of immune therapy, which many of you would have heard about, is uh, something called chimeric antigen receptor T cells, or CAR-T for short. Uh, it's a little bit complex, so I'll just go through this slowly. So this is a man-made drug molecule that consists of two components. The first component, as you see there, is made up of part of an antibody that can recognize the cancer, a specific marker on the cancer. And then this portion is then linked to a second portion uh, that can, of an antibody that can then bind and stimulate an immune cell, such as a T cell or a natural killer cells. And the idea here is that the genetic construct of this whole protein uh, or the genetic code or the DNA code is then established and it's all man-made. And this genetic code is then inserted into the patient's own immune cells, be it the T cell or the natural killer cells, right? And now uh, the T cells are now armed with this genetic code can then produce by themselves these CAR arms. So these are those cyborg man-made arm that can bind to the myeloma cells. And so just to explain this further, to give you a bit of concept. Now, normally our immune T cells can only recognize our cancer cells if we do have cancer, only via another protein called MHC molecule, MHC. And this can be done directly uh, from the T cells to the cancer cells or the or via an antigen presenting cells. Now the problem with multiple myeloma and a number of other cancers is that the cancer becomes very smart. So they downregulate the MHC molecule so that you can see that T cells can float by the myeloma cells and not even knowing that they exist. And so with the CAR T cell um, uh, uh, technology, what we do is we take the T cells outside the body we then insert the genetic code for the cyborg arm that I spoke about. The T cell can then grow the cyborg CAR, T, uh, car arm. And, they, and then outside the body, uh, the CAR Ts, th these cells are then stimulated to be very angry. The T cells stimulate into the millions and then reinfused back into the patients. And once they are back to the patients, the patients effectively have their own T cells that can then bind to their own cancer cells independent of this MHC molecule. 
So just to explain further, now the process is not all that straightforward, okay? It's not like you come into hospital and we can give you the CAR T cells. It needs to go in a, a process of manufacturing. So just to highlight the steps. So the person would have to come into hospital and the first thing we have to do is uh, uh, a process called LUCA, uh, leukapheresis. And so uh, some of you who have undergone stem cell collection for autologous stem cell transplant, uh, with sort of, it's a very similar procedure. Uh, so we put a central catheter in the um, central veins called a permacath. You then sit on a machine several hours each day for three days. We then take out all your blood and it goes through the machine. The machine takes out all the white cells and then return the rest of your blood through the other port of the cannula. And so once we collect this bag of uh, white cells, we then send it away to a, an external laboratory and the ex in the external laboratory, the T cells are then separated from all the other white cells. And then the uh, genetic code would then be inserted into the T cells, the genetic code for the CAR Ts. The T cells are then grown in, in a Petri dish and then stimulated to be very, very angry grown. And then the product is ready for use. Now this, this whole procedure can take weeks or can take months and that's the issue. And so a lot of times uh, patients may progress during all this process and may or may not even be successful. And so some patients may need what we call bridging chemotherapy. And bridging chemotherapy refers to treatment that we give just to hold the disease at bay until the CAR T cell uh, products are being successfully produced. And then once the CAR T cell product is being successfully produced, it is then um, reinfused into the body uh, after three days of chemotherapy um, and just a one infusion. Now, uh, there are a number of CAR T cell products uh, on the horizon, but the three leading CAR T cell products in multiple myeloma uh, are called Idacel, and this is made by a drug company called uh, Celgene, but it's now called BMS, it's been bought over. And then another product called Overcell, uh, again from the same company. And the one that I want to just focus on briefly is called Siltacel. Now, Siltacel is um, a product that's made by a drug company called Janssen Silag. And, and the reason why I'm focusing on this is because this product has now been uh, bought in, uh, in, into Australia on clinical trials. And, and this slide here uh, basically just shows the procedures as I've uh, spoken about before. So patients come in, get involved. Uh, they then have to undergo a process called leukapheresis and then um, to collect the, the, the T cells or the white cells. Uh, while that's being manufactured, the CAR T is being manufactured, um, they will undergo bridging chemotherapy. They may or may not need to, but they, uh, most people will need that. Uh, and once the CAR T cell product is ready, the patients then undergo uh, three days of chemotherapy. And this is you know moderate intensity dose, so it's real chemotherapy um, uh, with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And the purpose of this is that so that it can wipe out the T cells within the patient so it doesn't compete with the T cells we're about to infuse. And then the T cells, the CAR T cells, just one infusion will be inserted. And so, in, infused, sorry, not inserted. Um, and so this, this study is one of the earlier studies of this product uh, called Siltacel. And it's called a CAR, the Cartitude 1 study. Uh, when they initially uh, looked at this uh, uh, product, they did it in 29 patients. And you can see on in the uh, uh, red square there that these patients were very heavily pretreated uh, and a median of five prior lines of uh, treatment. Some patients had up to 18 prior lines of treatment. So these are the types of patients who had nowhere else to go. Um, and uh, uh, on the right hand side there, you can see that 100% of patients were triple exposed, i.e. they've seen image, they've seen proteasome inhibitors, they've seen anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies, and not much left. Uh, so very heavily pretreated, and yet the response rate, as you can see there, was 100%. Um, this was remarkable and really unprecedented type of a result. Um, and um, a lot of the response around 70% of patients had a complete response or better. On the right hand side there, you can see that 17 patients were able to be assessed for MRD negativity uh, and 100% of them, 100% of those who've been tested uh, did achieve MRD negativity. So this is really impressive. Uh, this uh, plot here is called a, a, a swimmer's plot and, you can, and each line represents a patient. 
and you can see here that the majority of the patients continue to respond. Uh, so the, that's the green arrow there. Uh, and some patient is still responding after, uh, you know, up to about 15 months. And this is only after one infusion of CAR Ts. Uh, and so just to give you some perspective, th this is incredibly impressive because for this group of patients, we only expect progression-free survival to be around two to three months only. And yet you've got some patients responding out to 15 months. Uh, now, uh, there is a catch. Uh, it's not a side effect free treatment. Uh, the most uh, concerning side effect we, we see with CAR T cells are cytokine release syndrome and neurological toxicities. So cytokine release syndrome is a, a situation whereby the CAR T cells that we infuse into the patients are so angry that they end up causing havoc, a storm. Uh, so, uh, and they can release a lot of cytokines and chemicals that can damage the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, and it can cause very high fever. So a person be, can behave like they're septic uh, with multi-organ failure. And some people may end up in intensive care. And um, even though it's rare, you can die from this. Uh, but I think with, it, with more and more uh, experience, uh, we are hoping that we can better manage this complication. Uh, the other complication that is quite common that is of concern is something called of neurological toxicity. In all honesty, we, we don't know how, uh, how neurological toxicity occur, uh, but we think it's, it's due with the immune system. Uh, and uh, this can present as, as mild, as just mild confusion, not recognizing your family members in the first few days, uh, or a more severe form of confusion, delirium are completely confused or overt neurological abnormalities such as unable to move, unable to speak, and then even seizures. Uh, it's rare, but it, it is serious. And um, again, hopefully with increasing experience with CAR T cells, uh, we can um, deal with this a bit better. The, the, the other issue with CAR T cells is that it's not an off the shelf product. So as mentioned, you can't just walk in and then be given the drug. Uh, it, you know, it takes a long time to develop the CAR T cell product. So uh, there are other immune strategies that are off the shelf product uh, and, and that can work very similar to CAR T cells. And these are a group of um, drugs called bispecific antibodies. Examples of bispecific antibodies can be T cell engagers. So these antibodies can stimulate the T cells or NK cell engages, natural killer cells engages. Um, and so uh, the, the concept is this, uh, like the CAR T cells, these are man-made molecules that consist of two components. Uh, the first component is made up of uh, an antibody uh, that can recognize the cancer cells on the left there, the green. This is then linked to another part of an, uh, an antibody uh, then that can recognize an immune cell such as the T cell. So you've got an, a single molecule with two arms, so to speak. And this can then act as a linker. And so when infused into the body, this linker can bind with one arm to the T cells and the other arm to the myeloma cells. So you can see like the CAR T cells, it enables the, the, the T cells, the T immune cells to bind to the myeloma cells independent of the MHC uh, molecule. And so the, the, the immune cells upon recognizing the myeloma cells can now kill the myeloma cells quite easily. And so this is how it looks uh, down the microscope. The green cell there is the cancer cell. The, the blue cell there is the T cells. Uh, the uh, drug, the bispecific engage is very small in between there. And you can see here that this T cell is very angry. It's producing a lot of cytokines and enzymes, multicolored, ready to uh, infuse into the myeloma cells and dissolve it. And so uh, there are a lot of bispecific T cell engagers that are in, in the market and in development at the moment. Um, and one example is a drug called teclistamab. And uh, this, the reason why I'm talking about this is, again, uh, this is an agent that is now on our, in, 
on our shores and are being tested in Australia, um, uh, being brought to Australia. So teclistamab is a, a T cell engager that's made by a drug company called Janssen Silag, uh, and it's uh, a bispecific that binds on the one hand uh, onto the myeloma cells, are uh, you uh, targeting against a, a specific protein called BCMA, which is only expressed on myeloma cells, and the other arm binds to a marker on the T cells called CD3. Um, and in the first uh, clinical study of, of this drug, uh, they looked at 78 patients. And again, like the CAR T cell population, these uh, were very heavily pretreated patients, uh, a median of uh, six prior lines of therapy and up to 14 prior lines of therapy. You can see here that the majority of patients were triple class refractory um, and 86% were what's called, uh, were patients were refractory to the last line of treatment. On the right hand side here, there, uh, you can see that there that at, at a very early stage uh, at the optimum dose, um, the response rate was 67% and the majority of the responses were very deep response. So that's VGPR or better. And at the time it was early, uh, but they only were able to evaluate five patients for MRD and four out of the five patients achieved MRD negativity. So that's incredibly impressive. And again, uh, you'll get very used to these swimmer's plot very soon. So this is another swimmer's plot. Each line represents a patient. And you can see like the CAR T cells, the majority of the patients continue to respond. And some patients are still responding up to about 19 months. So again, this is very impressive because you'd expect this group of patients to be responding only about two or three months with conventional uh, rescue treatment. So that's teclistamab. This table here is just to show that there are a number of other B, um, uh, biospecific antibodies in development. Um, and the majority is against the marker on the myeloma cells called BCMA, but there are some with different targeting different markers. And this is really important because if you progress on one biospecific uh, uh, antibody, you can then move on to the next as well. Uh, the uh, second last group of drug I want to talk about is an immune drug conjugate, and this is um, quite an exciting area of development. Uh, so again, this is a man-made uh, drug uh, that combines the uh, immune effect of an antibody with the myeloma killing effect of a chemotherapy. So again, this drug has two arms. The first arm will bind to the myeloma cells uh, on a marker such as the BCMA that we spoke about. And then the second arm can bind to an immune cell uh, such as the natural killer cells. Now, when the uh, uh, upon binding to the myeloma cells, the drug can then release a chemotherapy into the myeloma cells, causing it to die. But in addition, uh, by a close proximity of the uh, cancer cells to the myeloma, sorry, the immune cells to the myeloma cells, the immune cells can also kill the myeloma cells by an immune mechanism. Uh, and so you're sort of utilizing uh, two methods to kill the myeloma cells using one drug. And uh, one example of one example of an antibody drug conjugate is a drug called Belantamab mafodotin, or Balamaf for short, uh, otherwise known as Blenrep as well. Uh, many patients, uh, if you've been treated through St. Vincent's Hospital, probably have seen this drug before. Uh, so this drug, uh, as mentioned here, uh, contains uh, that three component. Uh, the first component binds to the myeloma cells. Uh, the second component binds to in immune cells. And when it's bound, it can also release the chemotherapy into the myeloma cells, causing it to die. Um, now, the issue with uh, the, the dream, two, dream 2 is uh, one of the first study that resulted in the FDA approving this drug uh, for use in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. And this study was, uh, I think, it was done uh, mainly in the US. And uh, 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 this was the very first study that looked at patients uh, with multiply treated myeloma with no other options of treatment. And they were given two doses of Balamaf 
uh, the first was 2.5 milligram per kilogram and then 3.4 milligram per kilogram. And in both dose, uh, you can see that uh, after a median follow-up of 6.3 months, so it's just early data, uh, the median duration of response was not reached in the 2.5 milligram cohort and 6.9 months in the 3.4 milligram cohort. Now, this is proof of principle that it works well, only because, again, in this patient population, you'd expect a progression-free survival of two or three months at best. But what was interesting was that uh, this group of patients, we would expect them to uh, survive uh, uh, only around 5.5 months, but yet in this study, patients were living twice as long. So this was the very first study that brought Bellamaf uh, to fame, or not to fame, but uh, uh, initiated further uh, investigations and pushed it through further clinical trials. But one of the main side effects of the drug is um, issues with the eye. So this drug uh, tends to get sucked up into the surface layer of the eye called the cornea. It doesn't do anything, it just sits there, uh, but it does cause blurry vision and that can be quite distressing. Uh, but it doesn't do any permanent damage at all. Uh, and so if you leave the drug there, uh, you, uh, you follow the patient up and you withhold the drug, it goes away and doesn't do, it's 100% reversible. But I think one of the reasons why this occurred in the trial was that um, in the study, they gave the drug too frequently. They gave the drug once every three weeks. In reality, in real life, uh, a person would only need a dose every two to four months. And this is quite remarkable because I've, I've seen patients given one dose of drug every four months with no significant issues to the eyes, and yet you can see the protein responding. Um, and I, the, I, so I think the, the, the role or the position of this drug down the track is for maintenance therapy, but it would be good to combine it with other backbones because it's well tolerated otherwise. And that's exactly what we're doing at the moment with a number of clinical studies at St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, there are a number of other antibody drug conjugates, and this is just to give you an overview that the options are wide in the future and the, and, uh, the armamentarium is growing. And so finally, I want to talk briefly about three small molecules, uh, venetoclax, selenexor, uh, and iberdamide. Uh, now, venetoclax belongs to a group of uh, drugs called the BCL2 inhibitors. So just to briefly explain, uh, BCL2 inhibitors, if you can see, is the green, the green molecule there on the diagram. Uh, and uh, it's a molecule that prevents cancer cell suicide uh, by binding to another uh, pro-suicidal protein in the pink, as you can see there, uh, so, and preventing this pink molecule from working. Now, venetoclax is a, a drug that binds that binds to the BCL2 and by doing that it displaces the suicidal protein and the suicidal protein can then be released to do its own job and forcing the myeloma cells to commit suicide. So basically venetoclax results in myeloma cells committing suicide. Um, and, and it's particularly effective in patients with the genetic lesion called 1114 translocation. Uh, and because the, these uh, patients or these patients usually, or the myeloma from these patients usually express BCL2. And this diagram here is from a, a study called the uh, Abellini study. And these, uh, this diagram is from patients with uh, 1114 translocation. And you can see the clear difference of progression-free survival in the green are patients who received venetoclax and their progression-free survival was markedly superior to the patients in the blue who did not receive venetoclax. And currently around 15% around of patients to 20% of patients have 1114 translocation. And so we would always look for that translocation because venetoclax is highly effective. And we at St. Vincent's Hospital and a number of other hospitals do have uh, clinical studies utilizing venetoclax. The next drug I want to mention is called Selenexor. Selenexor. Uh, it is a drug that belongs to a group of uh, family uh, drug called Selective Inhibitor of Nuclear Export, or SINE, S-I-N-E for short. And the way it works is this. In every cell of our body, we normally have a group of protein called tumor suppressor genes, uh, proteins. And these tumor suppressor proteins are supposed to control the rate of cell growth and the rate um, uh, uh, so, uh, and, and the rate of cell death uh, so that the cell doesn't become cancer. 
Now, usually uh, the tumor suppressor gene sits in the nucleus of the cells and it, it, gets, it then gets exported into the cytoplasm by a, a molecule called XPO1. Um, and so uh, the cell in XOR, by inhibiting XPO1, uh, it basically retains these tumor suppressor G, uh, proteins within the nucleus, thus uh, enabling the cancer cells to die and preventing the cancer cells from growing. So that's, hopefully that makes sense. That's the most simplest way I can explain it. But basically this drug is a tablet it's taken weekly, very convenient. And one of the study that brought it uh, to clinical translation was some, was the Boston study. And in this study, uh, patients were given cell and XOR uh, together with a backbone of bortezomib and dexamethasone versus bortezomib and dexamethasone alone. And what was found, you can see on the uh, screen there that the addition of the cell and XOR resulted in a significantly superior response rate, so 76% versus 62% in the, in the placebo arm um, and a longer progression-free survival, 13.9 months versus 9.64 months and a longer duration of response, so 20 months versus 12.9 months. Um, this drug at the moment is not uh, yet reimbursed by uh, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Uh, the clinical trials utilizing it is sort of done and dusted, it's, it's gone, but we do have a clinical trial at St. Vincent's and a number of other hospitals looking at the use of low-dose cell and XOR together with Revlimid in maintenance therapy for patients uh, post-transplant uh, with myeloma. And so the final drug I want to talk about is a group of drug called cell mods, cell mods. So this is a very complicated picture, so don't stare at it for too long. But the bottom line is that cell mods have multiple mechanisms of action. It's, it's a capsule, uh, exists in a capsule, and it works by binding to a protein called uh, cerebellon. And in doing so, it causes the degradation of two important protein called Icaros and Alios. Uh, Icaros and Alios are proteins that promote myeloma cell growth. Uh, and, and, and Icaros itself also negatively in, uh, regulate immune cells as well. So these cell mods agent by binding to cerebellum basically have two main effects. The first is that it causes myeloma cell death. And the second thing is it stimulates the immune system. Uh, so two birds with one stone. So it works very similarly to another group of drugs that you would be using now, lenalidomide or pomalidomide. So they're the imids, except it's much, much more potent. Um, and there are a number of clinical trials looking at cell mods. The first in class, the first member of this family is called iberdamide. So iberdamide exists as a capsule. And in one of the earlier trials, iberdamide in combination with dexamethasone resulted in very meaningful response in patients with uh, heavily pretreated disease. So you can see in this graph here uh, that uh, uh, patients, the response rate in different groups of patients were in the order of 30%, irrespective of how heavily pretreated uh, they were. Um, and so again, this is a, uh, another swimmer's plot to show that some patient could respond out to two and a half years. So that was very impressive. And this, we're talking about just a capsule. Uh, and so there are a number of, um, uh, there is a second generation cell mod called CC92480, incredibly effective in my experience. Uh, we do have a clinical trial uh, utilizing that agent at the moment. And so far I've been incredibly impressed. Um, so those are the main drugs on the horizon. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll stop there. But I do want to spend the last slide, though, uh, I guess uh, uh, giving a plug for clinical trials because the role of clinical trials is becoming more and more important uh, in the care for cancer in general, but specifically multiple myeloma. So clinical trials in the context within our health care system uh, uh, it's important to understand this. So we're in Australia, we're very lucky in that we do have a healthcare system that provides equitable access to uh, health services and medicines for all patients in Australia. Now for a drug to be reimbursed by the pharmaceutical benefit scheme so that we can get it at very low cost, it has to first be approved by our regulatory body called the TGA, so Therapeutic Goods Administration. And just to give you a bit of perspective, 
of the five to 10,000 new drugs that are discovered in the laboratory, only about one to two actually make it into clinical development, into clinical trials, phase one to phase three. And of those, only about 20% make it to the point uh, of reaching regulatory approval. And of those, an even smaller percentage uh, gets reimbursed by our Medicare system, uh, by, by our PBS. And so you can see the drugs that I'm talking about now and the drugs that you are already receiving, there have been a lot of work that's gone on in the background. Uh, so I think that um, I'm just saying this for, to, to, um, to praise the unsung heroes who work behind the scene to make it all happen because by the time I get to talk to you about it, millions of people have put all their hearts and souls and effort into this. And so I just want to acknowledge them. I think in the interest of time, I, I, I will uh, stop there and take any questions. And I do apologize about my um, technological inept just now. Thank you. Thank you, Hung. Thank you, Professor Koch. What it's always very exciting to, to hear about the new treatments, new new treatments and drugs on the horizon. I'm sure that's instilled hope in many of our viewers today. Thanks so much. We do have questions coming through, uh, and just a reminder that if we don't get to your question today, we will uh, reply to you via email. Um, but to start with, we've had a question from Mark in Queensland, Professor Koch, that asks: He's noticed that some new treatments rely on stimulating the immune system, will these still work if your immune system hasn't returned following treatment such as a stem cell transplant? Mark, I think you've hit the nail on the head because for a long time that was a problem. Uh, immune therapies have been successful in lymphoma and other cancers way before they were successful in myeloma because the myeloma cells, the myeloma immune system is so impaired. Uh, but now with the, uh, so the answer to your question in short is yes, we can still stimulate the immune system. Uh, uh, with uh, immunotherapies are best used in the earlier course of the disease before the immune system gets so clapped out. And so you will see that with time, even though we test these agents at multiply relapsed disease, we're moving more and more upfront for that very reason that you've pointed it out. So uh, for example, CAR T cells, the CARTITUDE study, uh, we're now trying to uh, participate in the study uh, that's been brought to Australia for patients upfront. So these are newly diagnosed patients, upfront treatment. Uh, the CARTITUDE 5 is for patients who are not eligible for stem cell transplant. And the other uh, CARTITUDE 6, which hopefully will come to Australia, will be in patients uh, uh, transplant eligible. So we're randomizing between transplant versus CAR T cells. And I would hope that by utilizing these agents at the upfront setting or earlier in the disease course, it would be even more effective because it's already shown to be effective in people with multiply relapsed disease in whom we thought that the immune system was clapped out, but yet we can still wake it up. I hope that, that answers your question, Mark. Thank you, thank you. And just one more question from Julie, also in Queensland. She asks, what is the likelihood of Australian researchers creating new myeloma immunotherapy treatments, including CAR T cell therapy? Uh, thank you, Julie. Very practical questions. Uh, so, so CAR T cells therapy is already in Australia. Uh, they, uh, but they exist for myeloma. They exist in the setting of clinical trials. But as you know, for lymphoma and uh, acute leukemia, they are already being funded by the government. So they're already part of standard of care uh, in Australia. But for myeloma, hopefully that will come as part of standard of care. But now it's clinical trials. Uh, I believe a number of centres around Australia are already offering CAR T cell therapy um, uh, in, uh, for relapsed refractory multiple myeloma in the setting of a clinical trial. Uh, and uh, but, uh, uh, the CAR T cell therapy for upfront uh, treatment is about to be started and we're participating in that. Um, uh, and in terms of other novel therapeutics that, that are discovered by Australians, uh, in fact, the Veneta clax that I spoke to you about started, uh, was discovered by researchers at the WEHI in Australia. So I think in Australia with a population of 20, 25 million, we're, we're punching above our weight, I think. 
uh, you know, I, I think we've contributed immensely to uh, research and development for cancer in, 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 uh, in the world, despite the fact that we are such a small population of people. Excellent. We're grateful for people like you that are, that are passionate about it and contributing to that to that research. Thank you so much, Professor Koch. In the interest of time, we do need to move on. Uh, so we do thank you for, for speaking with us today. We're now going to move into a short break, probably just a couple of minutes. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning everyone, my name is Vanessa Hardy and I work for the Leukaemia Foundation as a blood cancer support coordinator in Adelaide. My background is, as a, is a haematology nurse and hospital social worker. I'm here today to introduce Dr Kate Van Dyke for session three for a lab tour and research update. Dr Kate Van Dyke graduated with a Bachelor of Medical Science from the University of New South Wales in 2005. In 2007, Dr. Van Dyke moved to Adelaide to complete a PhD at the University of Adelaide, examining the off-target skeletal effects of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like imatinib, in chronic myeloid leukemia. For the past 10 years, Dr. Van Dyke has worked in the myeloma research program, first at SA Pathology and now at the University of Adelaide. Dr. Van Dyke is currently a Cancer Council SA Beat Cancer Early Career Research Fellow at the University of Adelaide and a Senior Research Fellow at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, or SEMRI. Dr. Van Dyke's research focuses on elucidating the molecular and cellular mechanisms responsible for poor outcomes for patients with the haematological cancer, multiple myeloma. And I'll hand over to Kate, thank you. Thanks, Vanessa, and thanks for the invitation to come and speak with you today. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the Myeloma Research Laboratory and what we do, and then I'm going to give you a bit of a video tour of the facilities uh, that we have uh, at our institute. And I'm going to talk about one of the projects we're very lucky to have supported by the Leukemia Foundation. So the Myeloma Research Laboratory is part of the University of Adelaide. And we're based at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, or SAMRI, which is this building here that's um, affectionately known as the Cheese Grater Building. Um, so we're based here on North Terrace, just north of the Adelaide CBD, right next to the River Torrens. And you can see the um, Adelaide Oval just behind that. 
The cemetery was opened in 2013 and it was the first building that makes up what is now known as Adelaide Biomed City, which is a $3.6 billion biomedical precinct, which has the cemetery building and then the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, which is right next door, the medical school of the University of Adelaide, and also the University of South Australia Cancer Research Institute, which was built next door to that. This creates this real collaborative environment, which allows us to have close connections with researchers that are working in the area and also have cl close linkages with the haematologists and other researchers that are working at the hospital. So Samri houses over 800 researchers and other staff members, and we come from all of the main Adelaide universities. So University of Adelaide, UniSA, and also Flinders University. And Samri also has its own staff members as well. And we're coming together to do really diverse research into broad research areas. These are broken up into five research themes with the cancer research that we're part of coming under the precision medicine theme. And the cancer research that's done here covers not only multiple myeloma, but also there's several groups looking into different kinds of leukemias. There's a group that focuses on prostate cancer, and there's a couple of groups that look at gastrointestinal cancers like bowel cancer. And this is us here, the Myeloma Research Laboratory. The lab is headed by Professor Andrew Zanatino. You can see him front and center there in the suit. Um, he first started the group back in 2000 um, when we were based down at the old Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, and I joined the group as a PhD student, uh, as Vanessa said. Um, I moved from Sydney to join the lab in 2007. And when I finished, I stayed on in the group as a postdoctoral researcher. So the lab is now made up of about 25 staff and students with, with seven postdoctoral researchers like me who lead their own projects and have their own small groups within the lab. Um, we have three uh, laboratory support staff, so lab managers and research assistants who really help run the lab. And then we have over 10 students who are doing PhDs and also undergraduate students that we're training to become independent scientists. So I'm now gonna play, if it will play, um, got a little video tour here to take you through the Samri building. So here we are again, the uh, cheese grater building on North Terrace, and we're right next to the Royal Adelaide Hospital there. Um, and you'll see when we swing around, we'll go through the uh, doors into our foyer area that have, goes into this fantastic glass atria that are on both sides of the building um, in the middle of the building. And we're up on the fifth floor, there's eight floors. So in a minute we'll get into the glass lifts and go up to our office spaces that are on each of the floors. So this is our open plan office um, and it opens out onto the atria that looks down onto the cafe area on the floor below us. And this is the signature DNA spiral helix staircase that goes up through the center of the building. And we're just walking here through into the wet lab spaces that are throughout the building where we do most of our lab work. So one of the main tools that we use in the lab is what we call tissue culture. So we can take myeloma cancer cells that were originally taken from a patient and grow them under specialized conditions in the lab um, to allow us to do some experiments. Most of the time, myeloma cancer cells, once we take them out of the bone marrow where they grow from a patient, um, they don't grow very well in the lab because the bone marrow microenvironment provides this essential supportive environment that enables the myeloma cells to grow. But um, very occasionally cancer cells from a particular patient can be kind of encouraged to grow in the lab when we supplement them with a rich media that has proteins and other vitamins that will enable them to grow. And there's around 30 of what, what we call these cell lines that were originally taken from myeloma patients. And they've, they've been shared around the world with other lab groups. So we can all be working on the same, um, the same cancer cells to see how they behave. The oldest one that we use in our lab um, is, was taken from a 61 year old male patient with myeloma that was seen at the Roswell Park Memorial Institute in New York in 1967. And we're still using those cancer cells in the lab today. And this um, culture of these cells is really important as it lets it look, look at their growth and other behaviors in the lab. Um, we're really interested in looking at what happens when we switch on and off particular genes in those cancer cells to look at their role in the biology of the cancer. And um, we also look at, use them to look at the response of the cancer cells to new treatments. And we also wanna look at how the myeloma cells in, interact with those other normal bone marrow cells that are important in supporting their growth. So we can take normal bone marrow cells and look at how they interact with cancer cells in the lab. And then potentially if we can block that process of how those cells 
support the myeloma cells, we could potentially find new therapies to treat myeloma. Um, and as well as looking at the growth of myeloma cells in ditches in the lab, we also do some animal experiments with mice, which is a really critical step when you're developing new treatments. So before you can take therapies to the clinic, you do have to test it in, in animals. So um, SAMRI provides us with an animal facility that breeds mice for us and also has all the veterinary support staff that are available to us. So the SAMRI also has um, a range of other facilities that are really important in supporting our research. Um, one of these is the Cyclotron facility that we'll come to in just a minute. Um, and the Cyclotron makes what we call uh, radio labeled tracers. So this is the Cyclotron here. Um, many of you um, might've had a PET scan um, that your doctor would have given you to look at your myeloma um, cancer growth. And the Cyclotron facility makes those sorts of radioactive labels that are used in PET scans for patients. Um, we can also use these radio label traces in therapy and also for research purposes as well. And so the cyclotron facility here is the only one that we have in Adelaide, and that's really important for supporting the research and also um, the patient care that we do in Adelaide. And we also have based here at the SAMRI the South Australian Cancer Research Biobank. Um, so I mentioned before that we uh, use myeloma patient samples, so cancer samples. The cancer samples that are collected at some of the hospitals around, um, well, when, when patients have a bone marrow biopsy or other blood collected at some of the hospitals around Adelaide, they can choose to donate a little bit extra of their bone marrow or their blood to um, the cancer biobank. And then we are allowed to use those samples as in our research. And um, this enables us to look at the, those patient samples, to look at what genes and proteins are switched on and off in those cancer cells, and also look at how that's associated with the outcomes for those patients and how well they do on their treatment. And we're really lucky to have that resource available. And I'm really grateful to all the patients who have allowed us to take that little bit of extra bone marrow when they get their, their um, diagnostic samples done. Um, I've donated bone marrow myself um, for research purposes, and I know that it's not the most fun experience. So I'm really grateful to patients who have donated samples and to allow us to use them in the lab. And so this is the liquid nitrogen facility where we store those patient samples. They're stored at minus 200 degrees, which um, preserves the samples. We have samples that we've collected from patients over the last 20 years, and we can still use those in the lab today. Um, so that hopefully gives you just a little bit of an overview and an insight into some of the work that we do in the lab at SAMRI. And um, I'm now gonna go on to talk more specifically about one of the projects that we've been working on that's been really generously supported by the Leukemia Foundation. That video to finish. Okay. So over the last 20 years or so, there's been some really huge progress in the development of new therapies that have really dramatically improved the, the outcomes for patients with myeloma. So if we go back to the 1960s, the only real treatment option for myeloma patients then was melphalan, which is one of these conventional toxic chemotherapies that you often think of when you think of cancer treatment. And unfortunately, because of the high toxicity of that drug, it could be effective for patients, but it couldn't really be used at high enough doses to get the myeloma under control long term. So the average survival for patients back in the 60s was only around one and a half years. And that's mainly because chemotherapies like melphalan have these um, toxicities for the normal bone marrow cells that are really essential for making our white blood cells. So it wasn't until the 1980s that it was found that you could use a high dose of melphalan if you were followed it up with a bone marrow transplant to replenish those normal stem cells that are critical for making our white blood cells. And this really, um, um, was a, a game changer for the treatment of myeloma patients and it increased survival for patients to around two and a half, three years on average. So then in 1999, there came this flurry of new developments in myeloma treatment that moved away from the more toxic chemotherapies to what we call more targeted therapies to treat the myeloma. This started with the, um, the introduction of thalidomide treatment in 1999, which was followed by other related drugs, um, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and also bortezomib, which was first introduced in, in 2002 for treatment of relapse patients. And more recently, we've seen an introduction of immune therapies like daratumumab 
the further increased survival for patients. So now survival for, for the average patient is over six years with many patients living much, much longer than this. So this shows how dramatically there have been improvements in survival with these new discoveries in cancer treatment. However, there's still patients, some patients that don't do as well. And many of our, our projects are based around looking at why some patients do better following diagnosis while others don't. So I'm just gonna focus on one of these drugs, um, bortezomib, that you might know as Velcade. Let's get the next slide, please. So bortezomib was first introduced as a frontline therapy for myeloma patients in Australia in 2008. And it's become a real mainstay of myeloma therapy. So it's using the majority of patients. And its introduction was, as I said before, was associated with a really dramatic improvement in survival for patients. And it was one of the, the first therapies which was really rationally designed to specifically target myeloma cells. So how does um, bortezomib bubble velcade work? Well, myeloma cells come from a normal immune cell called a plasma cell. And one of the plasma cells really important job in the immune system is to make antibodies that are part of the normal immune response. You see this in myeloma as the paraprotein that's measured in your blood to track your cancer growth. And that's the antibody that's being made by your cancer cells. So in order to pump out these antibodies, the plasma cells have a specific um, specialized factories inside their cell to let them make lots of proteins. And part of this factory is called the proteasome which is involved in breaking down unwanted proteins in the cell. And what bortezomib was designed to do was to block the activity of the, that proteasome machinery in the myeloma cells. And that then makes um, these unwanted proteins build up and leads to death of those cancer cells. So this is a really excellent um, therapy, which is more targeted than standard chemotherapy, but unfortunately it also carries with it some side effects. And that's because when it's given intravenously for therapy, it's covered, carried through the bloodstream uh, throughout the body. And it can target um, other tissues, which are also dependent on this protein building machinery that bortezomib targets. So one of the critical things we see in patients is damage to nerve fibers that supply the hands and the feet. And this leads to a side effect that I'm sure that many of you are aware of called peripheral neuropathy. We see this in around four out of 10 patients that are treated with bortezomib, and it's associated with numbness, tingling, pins and needles, and can, be, can cause pain, sensitivity, and burning sensations in the hands and feet, and what we call this stocking and glove pattern. Um, so some people get a milder form of peripheral neuropathy, and it's, and it's not as detrimental to them, but for some people that have a real um, negative impact on quality of life for patients. And when, when we talk to patients, um, I've been really struck by how the side effects that patients get from their therapy can have a more of a negative impact on their life than the, cancer, the side effects of the cancer itself. And this is one of the real issues that, that patients often bring up as being a real problem. Um, and if the peripheral neuropathy is too severe, patients might have to decrease their dose of the drug that they're getting, and which also means they might not be getting the best possible treatment that they can for their cancer. So seeing how this affects the patients that we interact with makes us, made us really want to look at ways of decreasing these side effects. So because myeloma is specifically found in the bone marrow around the body, we wanted to look at ways of increasing the delivery of the bortezomib drug from the bloodstream into the bone marrow where the cancer cells are to see if we can more effectively treat the cancer and then decrease those side effects on the other normal tissues in the body. So we discovered a drug that we think we can, can do exactly this. Um, we, we, we think that it can increase the delivery of bortezomib and also other cancer drugs that are used that might have side effects and decrease, increase its delivery directly to the cancer cells in the bone marrow. And I'm gonna spare you all the nitty gritty details, um, but I'll just let you know that last year we published a paper showing that using this drug, which has a really not catchy name of LCRF0006, which hopefully we'll rename it to something a little not snazzier. Um, but we, so we've shown that we can uh, in really dramatically increase the effectiveness of low doses of bortezomib by combining it with this other drug. And so we're thinking that, um, that by using a lower dose of the drug, we can then decrease those off-target side effects like peripheral neuropathy. And we're about to start some studies to see if by using this combination with bortezomib, we can then decrease the side effects 
um, in animal models. And then hopefully this will lead to a treatment that we can use in patients. So hopefully in patients, we could use it in combination with a low dose of bortezomib to, so then we could decrease the side effects of the drug, decrease the peripheral neuropathy that causes such um, an impact on the quality of life of patients with myeloma, and then ultimately allow, allow them to remain on the best possible treatment for their cancer to have the best outcomes. So finally, I'd just like to thank everyone who's involved in this project. Uh, Professor Andrew Zanatino, who, as I said, heads the laboratory and who is my mentor. Um, Dr. Chris Mrozic, who was my PhD student who was working on this project and is now working as a postdoc in our lab. Sadia Munir, who's our new PhD student who works on the project. And Vaughan Duggan, who's our uh, research assistant on the project. I'd also like to thank our collaborators, Oris Blaschuk from McGill University in uh, Montreal in Canada, who provided the drug that we're testing here. Claudine Bondo, who is an expert in vascular biology, who's um, helping with the, the drug del delivery aspect of the project. And Mark Hutchinson, who's an expert in pain at um, University of Adelaide, who's assisting with the neuropathy study. And finally, I'd just like to once again thank the Leukemia Foundation for funding this project. Without, this, without their support, we really wouldn't be able to do this work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, there's one question that has been asked, and it's, where do you hope to see the research project in one year and five years? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in the next year, we're hoping to complete those peripheral neuropathy studies in, um, so looking to see if we can decrease those side effects in animal models. So that's a really important step um, to get it into the clinic. And then um, in five years, we'd hope to have um, a clinical trial underway to look at the, the safety and effectiveness of, of this combination of drugs in patients. Wonderful, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Kate. Um, so the next session um, is with Nick Weber, um, Treatment Discussions and Drug Approval Process. So I'll hand over to Nick. Thanks, Vanessa. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Nick Weber is a clinical haematologist at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital and senior clinical lecturer at the University of Queensland. He has a clinical interest in plasma cell disorders and is involved as a clinical investigator in a number of research activities in this disease group. He sits on the steering committee of the Australasian Myeloma Research Consortium and the Myeloma Australia Medical and Scientific Advisory Group. Dr. Weber is a passionate supporter of Myeloma Australia's mission to educate and empower patients living with myeloma. We are so pleased to have Dr. Weber here today to talk about making treatment decisions and the drug approval process. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Thank you very much, Kath. And um, thank you to Myeloma Australia for inviting me to speak this morning. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to so many people across the country. Um, I've been asked to talk about how we make decisions around choice of treatment and sequencing those treatments throughout the course of a patient's journey with myeloma as well as to talk a little bit about how these drugs are funded and how their use is regulated by the government through the PBS. So I'd like to just describe some of the factors that we consider as doctors when choosing treatment for our patients with myeloma. And you can divide these into patient disease and uh, availability issues. From a doctor's perspective, I always assess a patient's age in the context of their general fitness and what other medical issues they may suffer from that could influence how they manage or how they cope with uh, their myeloma treatment. For patients who are beyond their first line of treatment, it's important to know what toxicities or side effects they've suffered from with previous therapies and whether there's any presence of chronic organ dysfunction, particularly kidney failure, that may influence the safety of any subsequent therapies that we're considering. From the point of view of the disease, it's also important to take into account how the disease is progressing, whether we're looking at somebody with relapsed myeloma who's progressing quickly, or whether it's a slower, more grumbling relapse. The cytogenetic risk factors are important, particularly at diagnosis, but more so or increasingly so at subsequent relapse. Response to previous lines of therapy is also an issue that we take into account because we know that some agents can be successfully used again a second time round uh, in patients that have demonstrated good responses previously. 
And the final issue that really makes uh, an important impact in the day-to-day -day clinic is the availability of these medications on the PBS. Now, the PBS is the system that subsidises access to expensive therapies, uh, including all of our treatments for cancer in general, not just myeloma. And the PBS uh, has a number of um, restrictions on when and how we use these medications. These restrictions may relate to at what point in the disease we have access to the medication, whether we're able to combine it or combine them uh, within or across different drug classes. And they also may limit patients who have had previous exposure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are issues that I take into account as the clinician, but there's obviously also a number of considerations that patients will have in mind, and they may not necessarily be aligned with what I'm recommending. And that's where the patient and doctor have to come together to negotiate the best choice. These considerations uh, practically revolve around, in my experience, how the drug or how the medication is delivered and in what schedule it's, it's given. Whether this is a, a tablet that we choose or an injection, whether that involves weekly trips to the clinic, twice weekly trips to the clinic, and whether there's any additional treatments that are required Factors that often come into play are the distance that patients live from the hospital and what transport options are available, whether there's a carer that's available to accompany the patient and whether that carer can take time off work. That obviously then contributes to the financial burden of, of these treatments for the patient, things like petrol, parking and associated supportive care medications and associated uh, prescription costs. There's also the burden of symptoms, either symptoms from the disease or from previous therapies that may affect a patient's ability to attend clinic, to sit in a chair for six hours, uh, to come to the hospital twice a week. Sometimes those symptoms can be limiting and it can be very difficult to deliver these treatments. And the other issue, of course, is the acceptability of the side effect profile to the patient whether the disease or the treatment that we're recommending is one that's associated with the side effect profile that patients are comfortable with. And that's becoming an increasing issue because a lot of the myeloma therapies that we access now and that will be accessible in the near future do have some quite specific side effect profiles that aren't like our traditional chemotherapy drugs. And so it's important that patients are informed of these side effects and that they are prepared to um, to proceed with treatment should those side effects occur. This is a, a really good slide. It's, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti and that's really the point is to try and describe in, in a picture how complex myeloma decision-making is. So this is what we call a Sankey diagram, which visually describes the flow of a group of patients through various time points in their myeloma disease course. We have, uh, on the left-hand side, the first vertical line is initial diagnosis. The first red vertical line there is the time of transplant. The second vertical black line represents the initiation of maintenance treatment after a transplant. And the third vertical black line indicates the time of first relapse. So you can see that at each time point in the disease, there are multiple different choices of medication. And not all patients receive the same treatment at each time point. We have the option of using an imid agent, so that's lenalidomide or pomalidomide or thalidomide is the group of imid drugs. We can use imid agents plus a proteasome inhibitor or PI, and that would be bortezomib or carfilzomib. And then the choice is also to use the PI on its own. And so this is a collection of data from almost a thousand patients across the United States, and it really shows you how their disease uh, their treatment changes through each time point in their disease. Some patients may receive a combination therapy up front and then go on to imid maintenance. Some patients may receive proteasome inhibitor up front and proceed to no maintenance. And then at relapse, retreat with imid with or without uh, proteasome inhibitor. So the point of this slide is really just to get across at multiple time points with multiple choices. Not every patient's treatment is going to be the same. And one of the hallmarks of, of myeloma care is learning how to individualise treatment so that each patient 
can navigate this system and navigate this process to work and to find the best treatment option for their disease and their circumstances. At the moment, however, in Australia, um, we rely on the federal government to fund our myeloma therapies through the PBS or Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. And for newly diagnosed patients, this has now become quite, uh, quite standardised. Um, the vast majority of patients in Australia who are diagnosed with myeloma uh, in the last six months uh, will have received a combination of IMID plus PI, which is the VRD regimen or Velcade, Revlimid and Dexamethasone. So that combination is subsidised by the government and is really one of the most, if not the most active um, combinations for induction treatment in myeloma available at the moment. We have two pathways, as you, as you are familiar with, the transplant eligible patients who will receive VRD followed by transplant and then the option of further VRD followed by Revlimid maintenance. And for those who are ineligible for transplant or who prefer not to proceed with the transplant, VRD induction followed by Revlimid and dexamethasone maintenance. And so this is quite a standardized process now for patients newly diagnosed with myeloma. These treatments are available on the PBS and our practice across the country is really quite uh, uniform. At first relapse, however, we now have a number of different options that the PBS will allow us to choose. And so the choice of these options really goes back to what I was talking about in the first slide, trying to individualize this decision together with the patient to find the best option. Very few of these drugs have been trialed as a direct comparison in clinical trials. A lot of the time they've been tested and compared with older therapies, or they've been tested and compared with therapies that uh, are no longer standard of care or, or choice of treatment in Australia. And so we can't say from this list conclusively which is better than the other because we don't have the, the clinical trial data to make that choice. A lot of these regimens are very effective and they all have slightly different side effect profiles. The regimen that is most recently approved on the PBS at relapse is the DVD regimen or daratumumab bortezomib dexamethasone. And the PBS has stipulated that this can only be accessed in patients who have had one prior line of therapy. And that's because this is where the government or the PBS has deemed the therapy to have the most efficacy, so to be the most effective uh, at the most um, acceptable price for the, for the PBS. The second option is carfilzomib dexamethasone, lenalidomide dexamethasone, bortezomib is accessible again in relapse, and thalidomide is still available on the PBS, although it's not used very frequently anymore uh, due to the availability of other better tolerated options. For second relapse and beyond, what we have access to at the moment under the PBS includes pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And the government, again, uh, through the PBS, have stipulated that we can only access pomalidomide if patients have failed lenalidomide and bortezomib. And that may be failure because it stopped working, because it didn't induce a response at all, or because there were side effects that were intolerable and the patient was unable to continue on treatment. Carfilzomib dexamethasone is available at second relapse, although we generally wouldn't use this drug a second time if patients have, it, have had treatment prior. Same with Velcade and with lenalidomide dexamethasone. So these therapies are available on an ongoing basis for patients who continue to respond um, in second relapse or beyond. So that's the, the PBS subsidised landscape at the moment, but it is important to recall or to, to remember that there are options for accessing treatments outside of PBS. The first option would be a clinical trial. And so clinical trials offer patients access to therapies which are still in development, which are being tested to make sure that they're effective and safe. Clinical trials may also give us access to therapies that are on the PBS, but which um, may be used in combinations that the PBS won't allow. So sometimes you might have the opportunity to participate in a trial that uses an experimental drug, but as a control arm, um, as a comparator arm, it may access 
it may offer access to a combination of, say, daratumumab and pomalidomide, which is something that we couldn't do on PBS. So clinical trials are an excellent way of gaining access to treatments outside of the, the PBS rules. The other option is to inquire about the availability of drugs or medicines through a compassionate access scheme. Some pharmaceutical companies, when they're registering or in the process of registering their drugs and making approval or applications for approval on the PBS, will make their medicines available through a compassionate scheme at no cost to the patient so that physicians and patients can develop familiarity with those agents. So it's always um, the responsibility of the physician to inquire with the pharmaceutical company. They, they won't take inquiries directly from patients, um, but it's definitely an option to inquire about whether there are any compassionate access options available. And the third option uh, for accessing medications outside the PBS would be a self-funded approach. So if the, if the medicine uh, is available from the company directly, um, patients do have the option of funding that. In that situation, some hospitals may request that patients receive their treatment through the private health system as well, but that's a, a hospital dependent decision. So what is the pharmaceutical benefit scheme? And it's something that we as taxpayers um, basically pay for. This is a system that the federal government established after the Second World War as a means to ensure that Australians have access to medicines at an affordable price. There is a patient co-payment, as you know, um, patients are asked to contribute to the cost of a PBS medicine by a co-payment, which is currently $41.30 or $6.60 with a concession card. And it's important to know that the PBS budget has no legislated cap, which means that there's no um, set fixed figure that the PBS uh, can cost. It's an unlimited uh, system, which means that the government has to be very careful before listing a medication on the PBS, because once it's on the PBS, it has no real control over how much the medicine is prescribed, how often it's prescribed. We can see um, at the moment, according to the PBS website, they list 902 medicines with an annual cost of $12.6 billion. And that cost is rising each year, approximately 6.7% increase from the 2018-2019 period. So the PBS is not an unlimited pool of money. It's paid for by us as taxpayers. And there has to be some kind of gatekeeper mechanism to ensure that patients are um, have access to medic medicines, but also um, that it's appropriate and, and cost effective. This table is one that I've abridged from the PBS website, and it just shows what the cost of currently available myeloma therapies is in the, in the scheme of other cancer therapies. So they, they give a list of the top 25 cancer drugs on the PBS sorted by cost. And you can see that lenalidomide, bortezomib, carfilzomib, and pomalidomide are all on that list within the top 25. Now, this is before daratumumab was listed, so daratumumab is not included. But combined, these drugs cost about $314 million a year, which is about 2.5% of the PBS budget. So certainly not a huge um, footprint compared to other medical conditions and diseases. But these drugs are expensive and there has to be, as I said, some process by which the government can regulate their approval and their use. In order to do that, the, the pharmaceutical company that wishes to uh, apply for PBS reimbursement for their drug must go through this process. The first is to register with the Therapeutic Goods Administration and that involves submitting evidence to the TGA of safety and efficacy of the medicine, how it works, how it's provided, how it's taken, and what its safety and efficacy profile is. Once it's registered with the TGA, the company can then make an application to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, or PBAC. And this is a panel of doctors and health economists and consumer representatives whose job is to review the submission from the pharmaceutical company, uh, perform analysis of its safety, its efficacy, and its cost. Excuse me, I've flipped forward and then to advise the health department and the health, health minister whether they think that it should proceed to reimbursement. The PBAC must consider the effectiveness and the cost of the, of the medicine, but they also have the discretion to take into account other issues such as uh, toxicity and clinical need. And from time to time, the PBAC will invite 
stakeholders from the community, from the public, um, the pharmaceutical company representatives and doctors to attend um, a, a meeting where further information can be given and a further case can be put forward for why that medicine should be reimbursed. If the PBAC provides a positive recommendation that the drug should be uh, reimbursed, then that will then proceed to the PBS and after a final price negotiation uh, will be listed and will be available for physicians to prescribe. They may put limitations on the prescribing as we've heard from previous slides um, to regulate the, the use of the, the medicine. If the PBAC doesn't feel that the drug is effective or that it's not cost effective, they can either permanently defer and decline the application or they can ask the company for further information and, and that then would, would be deferred to the next meeting to make that decision. So at the moment, you may have heard that um, there are some submissions in progress with respect to myeloma. Um, an antibody drug called elotuzumab in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone has been put forward. The subcutaneous version of daratumumab has also been submitted. And a new medication called selenexor uh, has been submitted to the PBAC for consideration, either in combination with Velcade or um, with dexamethasone. And so these are the current uh, applications that are in progress to the PBAC and will certainly be interested to see um, how that process proceeds. Certainly, um, there's been a lot of frustration about the time it took for daratumumab to get onto the PBAC, uh, onto the PBS. And so um, sometimes pharmaceutical companies, if they're not successful, um, will reconsider whether they proceed at all with a resubmission because each submission does cost them a lot of money as well. Um, and in some cases, the pharmaceutical company may decide that it's not worth their while to, to proceed with the application. So just to summarize, um, treatment decisions are complex. Um, you know that as well as we do. The guiding principle needs to be um, the right treatment for the right patient. And sometimes the sequence may be um, straightforward and other times it may be a little bit more circuitous. The PBS restrictions do play a role in determining um, how we treat our patients. At the moment, in the upfront setting, um, the medical community is very uh, satisfied with what we have access to. We think VRD is a very um, effective and active regimen, and it's, it's high time that we had it in Australia because it has been used overseas for many years. We also uh, rely on PBS limitations to determine sequencing options at first relapse, and beyond first relapse, um, clinical trials always provide an excellent opportunity to access drugs outside of the PBS, both emerging treatments and existing treatments. And, um, and of course, the, the patients, you have a huge role in determining um, and, and negotiating with us about how we best proceed forward with your care. So that's all the slides I had. Um, Kath, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Weaver. Lots of information um, there that you've shared with us. Thank you so much. We did have a number of questions that came through before your um, talk, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I think you've answered most of those in, in the talk. We do have a general one um, from a patient in Victoria just saying they need to start a new treatment soon. What questions should they ask their haematologist? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's different for everybody. A lot of us have preferences about how we prioritize our, our treatment goals. Some patients may prioritize effectiveness. I want the most effective treatment that's going to get my protein down and that's going to keep me in remission the longest. Other patients might say, I want whatever treatment will allow me to stay at home as much as possible. I don't want to have to travel three hours back and forward to the clinic. Um, I want treatment that's going to work around my lifestyle rather than necessarily the treatment that's going to be the most effective. And so it really does require patients to think about that and prioritise for themselves. I would certainly ask your haematologist, um, firstly, whether that you're eligible for a clinical trial and if that's in the centre that you're usually treated in or a centre that's close by, it's always worthwhile asking if that's available. I would also ask, um, is the treatment schedule one that can be flexible or is it fixed? Is it possible to 
um, dose reduce if I have side effects? Is it possible to change the schedule if it doesn't fit in with my, with my lifestyle? Um, and then I think side effect profile is a huge issue because a lot of the treatments that we're using now in, in myeloma at relapse are continuous therapies. These are treatments that are started with no intention of stopping them until they stop working. And so the burden of, of treatment on patients can be heavy. Month after month, year after year sometimes of infusional therapy is a lot to take on. So it's very important to know what side effects are, are both short-term and long-term side effects are of, of a treatment and making sure that, that um, if there are side effects that, that they're recognised early and that there are strategies for um, either preventing or treating those side effects. Great, thank you so much. Um, our other question, which, which we had mentioned to you, that we've had quite a few questions given the current climate, um, people with general questions regarding the COVID vaccines. So we do have a question from Mary Ann in Victoria, um, asking particularly about patients who've had multiple lines of treatment already. Um, did you have any information on how effective is the AstraZeneca vaccine after first dose and then after the second dose? And she also adds, do we need to continue to take extra precautions after being vaccinated? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's coming up, I mean, almost with every patient I see in the clinic. Um, I think the two questions to ask, uh, one, will the vaccine, any vaccine, will it work in, in a patient with myeloma? And the second question is, am I at increased risk of side effects? The first question is really um, a difficult one because these vaccines are very new. They have been extensively administered across the world, but the data that we have on patients with myeloma is pretty limited. We only have you know, several hundred patients that have actually been reported in the literature to look at their outcomes. And the, the concerns, not only with myeloma, but with lots of blood cancers, is because the immune system is so affected both by the disease and by the treatment, um, it seems that these vaccines are not as effective as they would be in the otherwise healthy population. The body just can't mount an adequate response to the vaccine. Uh, even after two doses, the rate of immunity that um, we're seeing with the, the COVID vaccines is lower than in the healthy population. That doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't have the vaccine though, because there is a proportion of patients who will receive protection. And, and this, the second question is, will I be at increased risk of side effects? And blood clotting has become the major concern with the AstraZeneca vaccine. The blood clotting that we see with that vaccine seems to be via a mechanism that's very unique to the vaccine. We can't predict who's at increased risk of those blood clots yet. You would think intuitively that if a patient has had a previous clot or if they're on medications such as Revlimid or thalidomide that we know predisposes them to having blood clots, that maybe their risk of clotting after the vaccine would be higher. We don't know that yet. Um, what we think is that it seems to be a, a pure bad luck. Um, the blood clotting issue with the AstraZeneca vaccine is very rare and the people that are suffering that complication don't seem to have any common risk factor. So my advice to patients has been, um, you should definitely have the COVID va vaccine. We know that patients with myeloma have a higher chance of severe disease and death with COVID-19 infection. I don't think that the risk of clots or other side effects of the vaccine are high enough to warrant not having the vaccine at all. But bear in mind that if you do have the vaccine, you may not be fully protected against the, the COVID-19 infection. And therefore it is important to continue the precautions, social distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene. And it's important to encourage family members and close contacts to get vaccinated as well. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Weaver. We really are grateful for your time and your expertise sharing with us today. Uh, that brings us to, to the end of our seminar. So I'm going to hand back over to Nella and Linda. Thanks so much. So that concludes the proceedings for today. Myeloma Australia and the Leukemia Foundation Australia would like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, in particular, we'd like to thank our speakers, the wonderful mum of four, Bernadette Savinoff, Professor Hung Quach, Dr. Kate Van Dyke, and Dr. Nick Weber for your time and valuable insights. 
really think that the theme of awareness and hope has certainly come through in each of these presentations and I hope you can take something away. To the myeloma community, thank you for joining in today. That we hope you really have been able to take some piece of information or some new insights um, and, and even a real sense of excitement and hope for what um, is coming in the myeloma, um, in the myeloma world. Thanks, Nella. Thanks, Linda. Um, and I agree with you, it's been a great uh, collaboration and um, really wonderful to be working with the Leukemia Foundation again. Finally, um, just the little housekeeping at the end, can we please kindly remind you to complete the evaluation form that's located on the bottom of the page that you're currently viewing from. We greatly appreciate all your feedback, particularly what we, you would like to see in future sessions. The recording of this event will be uploaded to the Myeloma Australia website and Leukemia Foundation YouTube page in the next week or so, and will be available for playback. So if you wanna go back and watch any of the sessions or you missed anything, um, keep an eye out for that, it will be coming. We hope that you've enjoyed this year's National Myeloma Month program, and we really look forward to seeing you at a local event soon. Thanks once again, and enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. And for all of those in Victorians, all the Victorians in lockdown, please take care and stay safe. And everyone else too, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Myeloma Month.